Okay, my name is Jerry Fielka, and today is January 25th, 2015. It is an honor and a pleasure, Tim Corbin, to be with you. Thank, Thank you, you so sir. much. Good to have you. Good, good All right. to be here. First question, Tim, is what is the best thing for a human being? The best thing for a human being? Yeah. <laughs> Just enjoying life, you know, and however they go about that. You know, yeah. People go about it different ways. Yeah. What's your favorite form of information? My favorite form of information? Well, information superhighway these days. Anytime I need, need to find some information, I go on the internet. You yeah. Know, online. Yeah. Find everything there. And why do you think humans collect or gather information? Seeking knowledge. Yeah. You know, you know, there's, there's something they want to know. Yeah. Do you think this need or want to collect information, gather information, is hardwired, or is it something that humans learn? Is it something that's in us innately, or right. is it something we actually learn? Is it genetics, or is it a learned trait? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it's a little bit of both, to tell you the truth. Yeah. You know? But I think, I think we all have... And I certainly get them a lot, these little creative passions that are within you, and you're not going to be, it's like a bug in you. You're not going to be happy until you get that out of your system, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so that's what, I guess that's the origins of as far as processing, you know, pursuing things. Yeah. I like that word, processing. Do thoughts create emotions? I think so, yeah. Especially, you know, <laughs> the more thought you put into it. <laughs> yeah. I know with me, it's like, and a lot of times, uh, you know, stuff that I'd long forgotten about so long ago, but it's like just some vague, something vaguely will hit me about that. And then it's like, once I start thinking about it, putting a lot of thought into it, and then it's like, it all just kind of slowly comes back, you know, before you know it, I've got this fascinating story from my past that I hadn't even thought about since it happened, you know? Right. So. Well, that's so perfect lead into this question. Can you conjure up your earliest memory ever? My earliest memory ever? Well, Captain Beefheart said he can remember when he was born. <laughs> I don't know if I can go that far back. But, I mean, if not the earliest, one of your earliest memories. Well, you know, uh, in, the, in recent years, I've uh, put in a lot of time taking every old family photo that I can and uh, just everything, even from before I was born, you know, but, you know, I was the second in, uh, in a family of two boys, but anyway... Uh, I went through, you know, and I found every picture I could, and I put them all in chronological order as best I could and all that stuff. And uh, But the earliest memories that, it, I, when I look at the pictures, I say, I remember that. The earliest pictures that I have where I have a memory was, uh, I think I was like three years old. And I grew up out here in Southern California, but my mom was from Michigan, and we used to go back there for Christmas occasionally. So it was like a Christmas at the grandparents in Michigan when I was like three years old. Yeah. <laughs> the earliest photos that I that right. I have that I remember specifically that, that right. event, you know. So. In what year were you born? I was born in 61, 1961. Yeah. And so um, do you think memory is more a curse or more a blessing? A curse or a blessing. I guess it all just depends on how you move with it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, some things you bottle them up and they're always there, and then other things you just, you know, and I've noticed that the older that I get, things that used to, you know, things that used to really rub me the wrong way or just, you know, stuff that had happened in my life or whatever, as I get older, I look back on it now, it's like, <laughs> it doesn't really matter. You know? Right. I, I can kind of understand why I was upset about it at the time, but now, you know, that's just life, you know? So, yeah. So, uh, that's wise. Right. You get wiser as you get older. <laughs> yeah. Who were your earliest role models? Or just briefly mention one or two within your immediate family. And then the second part is <coughs> outside your immediate family. Okay. And what specifically did you get from them? How did they specifically influence you majorly? Okay. Role models within my family and outside of my family. Yeah. Okay. And, uh... Or just who made an impact on you, you know. Mm -hmm. If not necessarily, you use the word role model. Uh, well, yeah, that one's probably going to take some thought here. Uh, no, no problem. <laughs> within my family, the only grandparent that I ever knew that was still alive when I was a kid was my uh, maternal grandfather, my mom's father. And, uh, and I remember him, he was like a kind of a big, solid guy, you know? Yeah. And... Uh, and then, of course, I kind of heard later, you know, more, you know, after he died and so forth. But uh, as I grew older, he was, uh, 
he was a, a construction worker, carpenter guy. And I remember when I was a kid, when he'd come out sometimes to California, he'd like uh, build a shelf case for us in our room, or he'd put on a bought and put on a new door and things like that. You know, he was always doing handy work around there. But uh, you know, and it's kind of like later on, I got into doing a lot of carpentry work. I was uh, building sets for a lot of theater and TV and film productions. I got into set building. Yeah. And uh, but while I was doing that, then I started hearing these stories about how my grandfather was like, you know, his his background is, is a carpenter and stuff like that, and. Uh, and at some time I had a chance, uh, it was several years ago, but after I got out of college, I went through Michigan and stopped and visited an aunt. She had some of his old, you know, woodworkings, you know, some of the stuff that, you know, his, his hand, hand work and stuff like that. So, so I think that, yeah, I obviously, it was kind of maybe subliminally, but I think I had a lot of influence from him, you know, and, yeah. and they used to always say in my family, cause I grew up to be you know, kind of big and so they always told me that I had my grandfather's physique, you know, right. so, so I guess I got a lot from him, uh, uh, outside of the family. Uh, just someone major who made an impact on you, or it doesn't even have to be early. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, well, I'll tell you, I've been always been very interested in music, you know, and uh, more so as a listener than as a player. You know, yeah. I played some guitar and harmonica, but you know, I've had a lot of uh, uh, made a lot of great musician friends, and a lot of them are outstanding songwriters. You know. Yeah. And. Uh, so I know I got kind of just generally speaking, I know I got a lot of influence from them, and uh, and uh, like I said, developed a lot of good friends. One of the guys who I uh, struck up a French with, with before he died was uh, he was an old hobo musician named Utah Phillips, and uh, a lot of people he had he had a, kind of a cult gathering, you know. But I got to know Utah for like the last four or five years before he died, and uh, worked some shows with him, and hung out at his house a time or two, and things like that, you know. And uh, but you know, he, the guy was just such an amazing songwriter, you know. And uh, so, yeah, I definitely. Uh, Boy, I like <laughs> listing him as a major influence. Right. He is one of my heroes. Yeah, yeah. So. Truly, and the sad thing about Utah is most people know him from Moose Turd Pie right. because he had one novelty hit on Dr. Right. Demento. That'll never be but able besides to live that, that right. I mean, unless you go to the, you know, you got all praise to. Uh, uh, Annie DeFranco for releasing an album. Yeah, you know, come on, them, that's that's amazing right. to show gratitude to someone as right. important as him. Right. Yeah, so so yeah, I have a lot of a lot of fond memories of actually personally knowing Utah. You know. Yeah. And uh, well, let's let's uh, this was going to come up later, but let's ask you now. Utah Phillips says anarchy is making rules for yourself and not other people. Uh -huh. What's your take on that? And if you know me, you knowing him. Do you think you can suss out what he was meaning by that? Well, I remember one of the quotes that he gave was from an old uh, anarchist from back in the day, one of the uh, wobbly workers, uh, who he told the story about uh, when the guy faced the judge and the judge asked him if he, how did he plead guilty or innocent, and he said he pleaded anarchy. <laughs> and when the judge asked him what he meant by that, he said, well, an anarchist is anybody who doesn't need a cop to tell him what to do. Yes. Wow, <laughs> that's another way. Right. So that's a Utah story that definitely sticks out in my mind, you know. <laughs> Anarchy is, say it again. Yeah, he said, uh, an anarchist is someone who doesn't need a cop to tell him what to do. <laughs> Anyone who doesn't need a cop to tell him what to do. <laughs> what a great, so that's another rewording of that. What a great way to put it. Thank you so much. Yeah. And clarifying our, our major thinkers. So, um, did your parents raise you a particular religion? Yes, my father was a Baptist preacher, and my mom came from a very, very devout Christian fundamentalist Baptist family. And did you ever check out, or are you still practicing? Uh, I've, I've, I've checked out over the years, but I'm still practicing as well. There's a little church uh, back in Tennessee where I live now, that uh, down the street from where I live. I live on old family land in Tennessee, and uh, it's been in my family since back I think like early 1800s but uh, Corvin being the last name and the road that runs through there is Corvin Road and down at the end of the corner about a half mile from my home sits this little Corvin Road Baptist Church and so uh, I, so I attend that when, I, when I'm home and uh, but yeah no uh, yeah I grew up in the church and you know that's like some of my earliest music influences was little, little gospel tunes you know yeah. and uh, so uh but yeah, I went through that, and then yeah, um, kind of during my high school years, I think is when I really kind of started to drift off, you know. And there had been a lot of things going. My parents had divorced by this time, and you know there was just all kinds of family madness, I guess. But yeah, I kind of checked out at that time and started partying, and then uh, 
And uh, I always, you know, I never really was really, yeah, I remember when I was in my, uh, throughout most of my 20s, it's like among all my friends, I was the only one who didn't drink or smoke weed. <laughs> you know, they yeah. all did it around me. I was always the designated driver, you know. Yeah. But, uh, so I kind of, you know, was in and out of that stuff over the years, you know. But, uh, but uh, yeah, I uh, definitely, definitely came from a, a very religious family. Yeah. Do you think evil people exist or does evil use people as a vehicle? No, I think evil people exist because I know some. <laughs> <laughs> they are just pure evil. There's no other way to describe it, you know. Huh. How do you advise someone to deal with an enemy? And I'm going to set it up with a few modern thinkers' thoughts mm -hmm. first. Alan Watts says, if you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them. Mm -hmm. Coppola stole from the mob and the samurais. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Sort of morphed into the word frenemies. Mm -hmm. JFK says, forgive your enemy, but don't forget their name. Fellini says, I need an enemy. An old Chinese proverb goes, he who cannot agree with their enemy will be controlled by them. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of thoughts. Basically the question is, how do you advise someone to deal with an enemy? But before, how would you specifically react to the first one? Alan Watts, if you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's what I was going to say. I think, I think the, what I, for me anyway, over the years, the best way to deal with that is if you have an enemy, don't let them know how much they piss you off. Don't let them know how much you yeah. know, resentment you have towards them. Because that, like, as you said, that empowers them. You know, yeah. if they know that, then they will definitely pounce upon that. So that's yeah. the thing. Is just don't even let them. Don't even acknowledge it. You yeah. Know? Very good. And um, do you think the brain more detects consciousness or creates consciousness? Does the brain create or detect consciousness? Yeah. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's pretty profound. Uh, never really gave it much thought, you know. I, I really don't. Uh, probably a little bit of both, you know. Yeah, that's so. fine. Tim, do you more pursue happiness or more pursue meaning? Well, happiness the ultimate goal, but hopefully meaning through happiness, you know. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, what makes you happy? You know, there's got to be some meaning behind that, so. Yeah. What's faster, the speed of light or the speed of thought? Yeah, how can you measure the speed of thought? Yeah. <laughs> you can measure the speed of light. <laughs> uh, it probably depends on the person, you know. Yeah. I think, you know. Some people are slow, slower thinkers than others, you know. <laughs> so. Yeah. And there, this fill in the blank. I don't know what I think until I blank. I don't know what I think until I investigate. <laughs> That's a good word. Yeah. If God exists, what do you want him or her to tell you after you die? Welcome to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Um, so James Joyce was the first projectionist in Dublin over a hundred years ago. He basically checked out and said, this is stupid. Why should I go inside a building and see a movie of a tree when I can go outside and see a real tree? Years later, William Faulkner said, the best fiction can be more true than journalism. Why do we as humans have to recreate things in order to get them? Why do we have to go to theatrical play of people acting out life? Why don't we just live life? <laughs> well, I think there's a lot of inspiration that comes from, you know, checking out the stories of other people and what they've experienced, you know. And there's always things to be learned in that. And it's, I mean, who goes to see a show for any other reason besides entertainment, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the bottom line, you know? They want to be entertained, but at the same time, hopefully gain some kind of enlightenment through the production that they're seeing, you know? Yeah. Get something out of it. So, yeah, you know, I did theater for a number of years. I couldn't count how many shows that I was involved in, but, you know, I knew that everybody was there to be entertained. Yeah. Well, what first attracted you to theater and then to filmmaking maybe it was first theater and then mm -hmm. filmmaking yeah yeah so what first attracted you to theater did you go to plays growing up 
and then your your parents were taking you and you go oh, I want to do that or how did you come about that in the same with film well from watching television and film while growing up you know, not actually going to live theater events. no uh, the theater was there but no I never you know other than school plays or church plays I never really went out to any real live yeah. theater growing up um, but uh, but seeing these actors on TV yeah what really intrigued me the most was when I was a kid, when I would see an actor, a well-known actor, appear on a talk show, whether yeah. it was a daytime or nighttime talk show, but see them on a talk show, especially when they were well-known for a particular character that was, you know, in a popular show or right. a movie or whatever, you know. But when you see them as themselves and you realize that they are nothing at all like that character that you know them as, you know, when I realized this craft of acting, you know, and it's like I was just more and more, I thought, like, that's what I want to do. I yeah. can do that, you know. And... uh so that's uh, so I, I got into that and uh, who were some of those actors you were looking up to when you were first growing up? That, well, give me an example of one that you saw on a show like that. Well, uh, I'll tell you that the movie that really had a big uh, big influence on me, and then the actors that came out of that movie was uh, Easy Rider, and so the you know the Nicholson Fonda Hopper group, you know those those guys and. Uh, and uh, you know Bruce Dern and uh, you know Roger Corman and those films that he was making and stuff like that. And I guess a lot of them were uh, you know method actors. As, as I eventually when I trained for the stage, I learned the method. You know, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, Al Pacino and those guys. You know, so just just those guys who could really put on some intense performances. You know. Yeah. <laughs> and then when you'd see them, uh, you know, like I said, uh, appearing on a talk show or something like that. You know, and then or see them interviewed somewhere or whatever. And it's like, you know, so <clears throat> so that was. Uh, that's what drove me to it, and yeah. uh, out of high school, I remember I graduated out here in the Inland Valley, Montclair High School, but uh, my immediate plans was I wanted to just get out there in Hollywood and start pounding the pavements and knocking on the agent's doors and seeing if I, you know, where's the acting work and who's looking for actors, but anyway, I ended up, right after I finished high school, I got jerked out into Colorado. I was in Colorado Springs for a couple of years, but what really ended up being a blessing out there was uh, there was this guy from the New York stage, he'd been working out there for like a dozen different years uh, as an actor and, and all kinds of other stuff, directing and producing, uh, doing the New York scene. And uh, he had just come into the city, I think his in-laws were ill or something like that, and they decided they had a son they didn't want to raise in New York City, so they brought, so they had just come into the Springs right when I did, Colorado Springs, and uh, so I ended up getting some uh, professional training through some courses, workshops and stuff that he had offered and things like that, so, you know, so I got some... <laughs> grueling intense training when I was out there and uh, so this was right out of high school right out of high school yeah wow. when I went out there I thought at first since I had no other choice I just kind of got jerked out there you know here here I was going at Hollywood steps and before I could take a step in that direction next Boom. thing I know I'm out in the Rocky Mountains you know yeah but uh, no my plan was I just figured well I'm just gonna stay here for one year and then I'll go back and get my own place and set up and start pursuing the, the scene out there but uh, I realized after about a year of training you know I kind of had a chip on my shoulder thinking I was a great actor and these guys and that 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 uh, guy was telling you about uh, they taught me otherwise and I realized after about a year of training I thought man I don't know crap man I suck compared to a lot of these other guys you know and I thought here I'm thinking I'm going to go out and get professional work in Hollywood, and I'm getting blown off the stage by amateurs in Colorado. What is that telling me? You know. Right. So I kind of realized I had a wake up call there. I had a few experiences that really. So I realized then I don't need to go back now. I stayed out there for another year and a half, actually uh, two and a half years altogether. But I got some more training under my belt before I came back. You know? Right. And uh, as far as getting into the uh, video and film thing, um, I remember being a young struggling actor out there uh, in the Inland Valley in the early 80s and uh, performing on a lot of stage shows and I remember I was living out of the back of this uh, theater it was a storage room <laughs> living about as unconventional as you could but in exchange for some of my work there I was boarding there at this theater but uh, you know so I'm just barely getting by and um, young actor looking for my niche you know where can I really excel here and uh, now you can attest to this, you're older than I am, but, you know, having grown up in the pre-cable TV era, we weren't really exposed to that much you know, visual arts, you know. I mean, you had the mainstream movies out right. there, and then you had, like, three broadcast stations, and that was it, you know. So, and maybe a little PBS. Right, yeah. right. But they didn't show documentaries and stuff like that out there in, uh, in right. the movie theaters, you know. Yeah. So it wasn't until I was in my early 20s when cable started to come out where I was first beginning to become exposed to documentary productions. 
And the more I looked into them, and the more fascinated I was becoming, and then after a while I started saying to myself, that's what I should be doing. Forget this acting thing. If I'm going to appear before the camera, I should just be at myself and taking the viewers on some kind of a wild tour or something. You know that I can do. You know. So, so what do, what early uh, docs that you saw early in that in that revelation period? Oh, Were there any standouts that did uh, that? Yeah, and you know it's like I don't even know if I can remember the names of them now, but uh, but to one of them I remember it had to do with this. Uh, this family of hillbillies, these three or four brothers who were like lived really rural, and one of the brothers had died, and the local cops decided to charge one of the brothers with murder. They 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 felt that he suffocated him or something like that. The guy was in real bad ill health, you know. But I remember it was uh, it, and and uh, I saw that documentary, and then years later I saw I read something about it that it won some kind of awards and stuff like that. I thought, oh yeah, I remember seeing that. You yeah. Know? And uh, so uh, so but, that that sort of swung you into the film. Work. Yeah, it's more and more. By this time, I was doing a lot of traveling, going around the country. I was a cross-country biker at that time, and I would go from coast to coast, and I was just out on the road and going to a lot of places. And along the way at this time, there was a lot of interesting people that I met that had some unique background about them, and then there was a lot of fascinating places I'd been to that had some obscure history that's really interesting, but nobody knows about it. And more and more, I was coming away from people I met and places I'd been to, and I'd say to myself, man, what a great subject for a documentary that would make. And I could just, like, visualize in my head how I would lay it out and tell the story and everything like that, you know. <laughs> but, of course, the reality would then set in is all poor, starving actors who have brilliant ideas, the thoughts always conclude with, yeah, if I only had the money, you know. Yeah. <laughs> if, I, if I knew somebody who could back me on something like that, you know. So So what was your first production that you said, okay, I'm going to do it, I'm going to pursue just it? To, just to assure myself again like i said before about having that inner creative drive that you got to get out of your system the very first production that i ever had a chance to try to put just to prove to myself that i could do it was venice beach 1985 that we will be seeing later on this evening amazing so yeah, that was that, your first production that was my first attempt at doing a documentary and what was going on at that time like i said you know i, I had all these ideas but uh, i knew that that would never come to fruition and then uh Around this time in the mid 1980s, this is when home video cameras first came out. And uh, but the thing is, even they, you know, of course, all technology when they first come out, they're in their primitive stages. And so you can probably remember the first video cameras. They were those big boxes that you had to yeah. rest on your shoulder, and they were what were like 500 pixels or whatever. You know, they, yeah. were, they certainly had more than their share of limitations. But you know, I was telling myself then, I said, you know what? But even with primitive means, even with a home video camera, I bet I could create some kind of a documentary that everybody who sees it's going to really find it interesting and enjoy it. It'll be yeah. worth their time to watch it, you know. I said, if I could just prove that to myself, I'll be satisfied. And uh, now, of course, these home video cameras, when they came out, the standard brand, what were they, like $2,000, $2,500? You know, I mean, they, you had to be established enough to have credit and buy on a payment plan or something, you know. So so even with those primitive means, I thought, no, nah, I'll never be able to afford a camera, you know. But... What I discovered, though, is that although neither me or any of my other poor artist friends would ever be able to afford one, I discovered that I did have some friends whose parents owned video cameras, you know. <laughs> so the way that this that Venice Beach production started, I remember I was hanging out with a friend of mine named Doug, and I just told him some funny story about something that happened the last time I was out at Venice Beach, and then I concluded... I was really just kind of thinking out loud, but I shared that inner creative passion. And I said, oh, man, I'd love to make a documentary about that place if I only had a video camera. And then that's when he said, well, my parents have a video camera. And I was like, oh, yeah? You know? So that was the kind of start. But I remember the first day I went out there with this guy, it was a total nightmare. This guy wouldn't do anything that I'd ask. He didn't get it. I was trying to make a documentary. Just I'm trying to interview people, and he's shouting out over the camera and interrupting our interviews and just, you know, can't keep the subject on the can't keep the camera on the subject for more than a few seconds at a time, you know. If, uh, you know, out there on the boardwalk, there's so much going on out right. there, you know. Just anything can catch your attention. So, you know, some guy's giving a performance, and a pretty girl walks by in a bikini, and he's off the subject, you know, and I'm yeah. like, get the camera. So that first time, it was a nightmare. And I came home, just, I, I felt like a total failure. I was like, oh, man, I guess making a documentary is a lot harder than I thought. But, man, it shouldn't be this difficult if I can just get some cooperation. Right. But the theater that I was working at, I remember when I made this documentary, I knew that the, the peak hours, the time to be there to get all this stuff would be on Saturday afternoons. That's when the boardwalk's in full swing. Yeah. And the lighting would be right with the sun and all that. 
And uh, but the theater I worked at, we normally had performances on Saturday afternoons, and right. so normally, so I had to make a. Re I really couldn't afford to take time off from work, but this was far more important, you know. Yeah. So I had somebody fill in for me, but when I came back, I was telling this guy who filled in for me about what a nightmare this experience was, and one of the young actors who was sitting nearby heard my story, and as soon as I finished telling it, he said. My parents have a video camera. I said, I was like, oh, yeah. You know, so we were back. But, you know. Trying again. <laughs> I went out there on a total of three occasions. Because when I went out there the second time with this new camera guy, his parents' camera, the battery it was a separate unit. The battery was bigger than the camera. It was this big box yeah. that you had to hold on a right. strap over your shoulder. And we got out there, and we were shooting kind of liberally. You know, I figured, you know, a lot of the stuff we won't use, but it'll be good to have it anyway. And. Anyway, we got out there, and we hadn't shot more than about 20 minutes worth of footage before suddenly this big, giant battery died. Uh -huh. <laughs> and you can't go plug it into the wall and recharge it in an hour. You know, yeah. this is an overnight thing. So with that, I came out a third time, and, uh, and I, I, I uh, used, used it a little more uh, conservatively the next time out. Yeah. My only regret, I went out there a total of three occasions. The only regret was that uh, there was a lot of outstanding talent out there that, unfortunately, I never got a chance to catch up to them. And, capture their performance really? you know? well yeah. you did pretty good I, I right enjoyed so the film, but yeah right? i figured after Look that I'd, I'd i'd taken like three <laughs> days off from work three saturday afternoons i probably lost about 60 bucks in that whole deal but that was a lot to me then and so I and figured, then well, how'd you did you uh uh ran a editing system or no <laughs> did you edit many years later no well yeah both i my original edit back then my editing equipment consisted of two VCRs. Oh, in a pod. I was a poor boy. Man. Yeah, I had everything all queued up. I remember that uh, what I would do is I would play a scene. You know, I had a one VCR yeah. playing, one recording. Well, as soon as the scene ended, I would hit the pause button. Yeah. But you only had a couple minutes to queue up the to next queue up one. the next one. Otherwise, it would just go into stop yeah. mode. I, it took me and several attempts before I yeah. finally got a good clean. But yeah, I just went through there. I had all the cues written down and just quickly, you know, I just yeah, just just some quick edits, you know, no. Uh, so you sort of self-taught yourself editing. Yeah. yeah. That's great. I did that with Pixel yeah. too. Now yeah. what I've done here just in the last year when I rediscovered those tapes, now in the last year or so I've been doing a lot of, you know, I've been getting into uh, video documentaries again for the first time in 30 years, but now I have proper editing software equipment. I right. have Adobe Premiere and, you know, I've got a good HD camera and all that kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm getting back into this again and recently I, uh, was digging through an old box of videotapes and I found those old Venice Beach Masters. I was like, oh, it's something to, time to do something with these again. So now the one that we're going to be seeing this evening is one that I've re-edited properly. I've got text graphics and Great. sound effects. Yeah, I got yeah. It. So, so, so more properly edited this time. Yeah. So. so, but yeah, that was a project that just, I just had to prove to myself that I could do it. So yeah. I did it, you know. <laughs> that, Tim, that was really well put. Now, do you think, um, you know, uh, what McLuhan says is everything we invent extends some humanness, or he calls it human sensorium. So, mm -hmm. clothing is an extension of the skin. Knife and fork extends teeth. You could even say film editing is an extension of blinking. What do you think the video camera, the moving image camera, extends? What human sense or what human sensorium, what humanness is extended by the camera? I think just a lot of thought, you know. Yeah. You know, the, the, and then of course you've got your uh, your visuals, your aesthetics, and things yeah. like that. You know, pleasant things to see, pleasant things to hear, and yeah, and uh, but uh, you know, it's uh, it's 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 mood related, you know. Yeah. I mean, definitely. So, uh, no, so yeah, was... more 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 metaphysical, I think, more mental than, than yeah. And a screenwriting teacher told me a great film is when you can clearly see the intention of the maker. And Stanley Kubrick says the opposite. A great film or great art is when you can clearly not see the intention of the maker. What role does intention play in your creative process? <laughs> uh, can you run that by me again? Just yeah, it's sort of like, you know, when you're making your mm -hmm. art, when you're making your doc or mm -hmm. whatever else you're making, yeah. how much are you investing in tension? Like, you know, it's I've never liked, and I try to avoid this in my work. Is I don't want to do the viewers thinking for them. Yeah, you know, and uh, so a lot of times there will be some kind of a strong message in there somewhere, but I'll think to myself. I don't think I really need to say it, you know. I think it's there, you know. Yeah. If anybody's paying attention to it, they'll get that, you know. Yeah. 
So, uh, so that's what I try to do is just not make everything in black and white, you know, but yeah. uh, just you know, kind of present it in a lot, you know, make it thought provoking and they can, yeah. you know, come up with their own thoughts and, yeah, and opinions that's good. or whatever, you know. Well put, Tim. And Marcel Duchamp says there's no art without an audience. How much are you thinking of the audience while you're making your film or making being creative? Are you thinking of them? Or? Yeah, I'm thinking. I'm thinking what what will entertain them. You know what 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 would they really enjoy? You yeah. Know? And uh, and uh, at the same time, you know, when I'm out shooting too, just some stuff just kind of comes to me. You know, it's like I want to. I want to do some shots of this old building or whatever, you know, and uh, and uh, I'll do like a zoom or something, and just something will <laughs> something will pick up. It's it's. Uh, I'll give you an example. I was doing a documentary out in uh, in uh, Oklahoma last year, and it was about an old lynching that took place in the earlier part of the 1900s, and uh, it was this boy. It was a mother and her boy, and so it was kind of unusual in that sense. The boy was like 14 years old. And anyway, well, I found the old, what was at that time, the old jailhouse where the boy was jailed before he was lynched. And I was doing this zoom shot, and I was kind of like just kind of playing around. And while I was doing that, I happened to notice that on the old door, you know, it was all abandoned building now. But on the old door, somebody had stuck a decal up there that said, No child deserves to live in fear. And the relevance that that had to, you know, what I was shooting this for and all that kind of stuff, you know. So, I definitely, you know, and this was just, it was just something that I picked up on while I was there doing that. You know, I didn't, you know, I didn't know that that was there or anything like that. It was just it was something I discovered while I was doing some pan shots or whatever. So, every once in a while when I'm out doing things like that, something will pick up where I'm just like, you know, got to show, got to let the viewer see this, you know. Yeah. Maybe I don't even have to say anything about it. Just let them see it, you know. Yeah. Billy Wilder said that uh, black and white is more true than color. You've shot all your films in color, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Why do you think somebody like that, he's a great filmmaker, yeah. why would he even think that black and white could be more true than color? Or What do you think he meant by that? Just that uh, in black and white you got to use more of your own inner imagination, you know? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the colors aren't there, you know? So it's kind of like in your mind you got to you got to kind of visualize the color, I guess. But, uh, but uh, you know, interestingly, you know, when, when I would, uh, I've done some reading about some of the old uh, filmmakers back in the early Hollywood days, and uh, you don't realize it's nowadays, but uh, the black and whites that are made back in those days, there was so much, there was so much emphasis on shadows, and, and, uh, and you, know, you see some of those old films, what was, I was watching this one the other day, where it had like one of those lattice, lattice type of walls or but the the shadows that was coming through that into the wall behind it and it's like you know and you realize they intended that you know yeah. and uh, we don't see you know with color you don't you don't get into that kind of stuff you know right. a lot of people don't they don't even you know but uh so yeah it's just uh i think i think black and white definitely you have to use your own uh you know like i said it's not it's uh you got to use your use your own uh mind and imagination with what you're seeing you know? yeah it's a good answer. And McLuhan also said there's no such thing as a good or a bad movie. It's a good or a bad viewing experience. Uh -huh. Any comment? Uh, there, you know, there's movies out there <laughs> that, uh, you know, the first time you see it, you're just shaking your head like, what the hell was that? But there's something about it. We just got to go back and watch a little bit more of it, you know? Yeah. And then before you know it, you've watched it several times, and each time you watch it, you're getting more and more out of it. And before you know it, you're thinking like, what a masterpiece! This is brilliant! You know? <laughs> Could you give me an example of one film that, that happened to you? Uh, what's one film that that happened to me? Um, let me think about that for a second. Or any other, uh, just any films that made an impact on you growing up. Any other... Uh, Titles that stand well, out. Well, like I that, said, the, the Easy Rider had a big influence yeah, on me. Yeah, besides Easy Rider, and that and, a lot of that had to do with just the scenery. You know, yeah. I knew then when I was I was like eight years old when that came out. I knew that hey, when I grow up, I'm going to get me a motorcycle and I'm going to do that. I'm going to go cross country on a motorcycle. And instead, you, know? you did it on a bicycle, or you did? No, I it. did it on a motorcycle. You did on a motorcycle yeah. too. And I oh. even following their tradition, I went to New Orleans. Although I went in from the backside, from the Florida side. Wow, <laughs> so that's cool. Right, it's so. a good film to do it on. Too. Right, right, yeah. but. Uh, any other films that? No, I was out? just thinking though. Like, uh, I see you got Beefheart uh, 
picture over there, and I remember the, his album uh, Trout Mask Replica yeah. had that kind of effect on me, you know. Oh, did it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good, because I'd rather you expand it to any any right. other film, music, or right. literature that made impact on right. you. So what, uh, what age are you when you're hearing Trout Oh, Mask? no, the first, it was years after it came out, because I, yeah. I was still a little kid when that came out, but uh, I don't know, I think I was probably like in my early to mid-20s. Yeah. And, uh... And, uh, but yeah, I mean, the first time I heard it, I was like having a difficult time. So it was like almost, and, uh, almost put like this ill feeling in me almost, you know, it was just kind of like annoying, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, it's like. What after, music were you uh, gr growing up listening to? Was there a, a particular. You know, the fact that I grew up in a very devout religious family and all that stuff, the first music, the first popular music that I was really exposed to, the, the first albums that yeah. we had was uh, Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass. Yeah. You know, and I was uh, uh, in, into the Herb Albert thing there when I was a little kid. Then, With of the course. Whip, whipping cream cover? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so those were like. Now, now, we didn't have that one. That was a little too risque yeah. as far as the cover goes, but we had some of the other ones that he that he put out back then. But. Uh, then of course with uh, with radio, you know, of course naturally through the neighborhood and all, we became more and more exposed to the top forty radio stations and the rock and roll hits of the day, you know. Yeah. So uh, grew up pretty much on rock and roll. I remember when I was a kid, there was basically there was only two types of music that played on the radio. You had rock and roll and country, and all yeah. the kids listened to the rock and roll, and all the parents listened to country, and we couldn't stand their country, and they couldn't stand our rock and roll. You know? Right. That's the way it was back then, and uh, yeah. And, uh, but. Uh, but no, you know, as, as I was getting older into my into my adult years, 18, 19, 20 years old, then I started uh, becoming more exposed to other types of music that was like really starting to catch me, you know. And yeah. it's like, uh, you know, I, I picked up, uh, I was, I remember I was walking down some outdoor mall and some place was playing bluegrass music. Right. I never liked country, but this wasn't really country. It had no. the banjo oh, and right. it had the mandolin and all this stuff. I was like, well, well that's kind of neat, you know. And then sometime shortly after that, I remember... Uh, being somewhere where I heard an old blues song, I think it was an old Muddy Muddy Waters tune or something like yeah. that. But it's like, whoa, you know, and I got into the blues music then. So more and more, I started just widening my my music uh, that is knowledge beautiful. and spheres, right? So and a lot of the trips that I've taken over the years, I've gone to like places because of the, their music hotspots, you know. Yeah. So what do you think the function of music is? The function, entertainment, you know. Yeah something whatever pleasing to the ears you know yeah. and some people like songs that have heavy lyrics you know they want a message out of it and some people just like the music you know yeah. just the tune yeah so i spoke with a guy who's a pretty good uh documentarian and a major filmmaker michael aptit you know he made the 28 and up series and okay coal miner's daughter and this was 30 years ago and i said why do rock video makers feel so obliged to edit fast because he had made a documentary on a Russian rock star and uh, he told me because we've learned to take in information faster in fact Marty Scorsese said he, I edit my films faster because of MTV you know this was 30 years ago <laughs> so do you think we can actually learn to take in information faster or are we just brainwashed to believe we can probably the latter yeah <laughs> I don't know. I know that when I'm when I'm editing together a project, you know, uh, I'll go through it, you know, two or three times when I've got it down to where I like it. But I notice that every time I watch it after that, there's a few more things I pick up on. So it's like when I'm when I'm reviewing it, I'll watch it through and I'll have like ten different notes here, ten different little corrections I want to do. And I go through there and do that, and then I watch it again. Well, now I've picked up three more that I didn't see the first yeah. time. Then I go through. Now I have picked up ten more. You yeah. know, it's like so it'll kind of fluctuate, but it takes me. I, I'll I'll watch it several times before right. I really got it down. And even after I've like finished it and posted it online or whatever, even then sometimes after the fact, there's still a couple things that I wish that they had too late now. But I wish I could. You know. Yeah. So it's like you know you can over tinker those. What I've learned sometimes I yeah. over you know I got into it so much that it was it was better the way I had it yesterday than what I've done to it today you know? yeah. so sometimes you kind of know when to stop do you think we uh, humans can li literally multitask yeah yeah you, know, you almost have to these days yeah. yeah I was thinking the other day about this uh, theater that I, I was telling you, I used to live in the back of that uh, rehearsal hall and uh, when I was working the shows there at night uh, and I was usually running it by myself I might have an assistant or two but uh, 
But uh, there were occasionally we would like oversell the place. I mean, not just sold out. We've got more people that have arrived than we can ever squeeze in there, you know. But uh, those nights, I was thinking about it because I, you know, it was years ago when I used to work those things. But I thought, like, yeah, I remember they were real tense. You had to be on your toes at all times. But I'd been through this so many times by now. I had everything down to a very intricate science. So I knew exactly what had to be done, when it had to be done, how it had to be done. And. No matter how hectic it was, I never started a show more than five minutes after the hour. You know, 8 o'clock was supposed to be the show time. I almost always had that show running at 8 o'clock. But sometimes if it was tense, I might have to go a few minutes over, but not much. But it was I was definitely multitasking when I was doing all that stuff. Yeah. you got to do three or four things at once, you yeah. know. So. That's good. So, um, what? Uh, well, let's start off with the slew of political docs we've had. We've, in the last 20 years, there's really been an increase on political docs, and it because you can make them in your living room, you don't need a big budget and a crew. And Jean-Luc Godard told Michael Moore when he premiered uh, Fahrenheit 9-11 in the Cannes Film Festival, this, uh, this film is going to help Bush get elected. Now, it didn't necessarily help Bush get elected, per se, but it did galvanize pro-Bushers, which wasn't, you know, Michael's intention. Yeah. And so, with this increase of political documentaries, the bottom line question here is, Basically, do you think the they more activate people or more pacify people? Uh, people in general? I don't know. It, it does seem like it gets people really charged up, you know. I mean, it, I don't think it pacifies anybody, uh, if anything, but... Uh... I know that for me, the more I the more I see that stuff, the more ridiculous I realize it all is. You know, so it's like it's hard for me to take it all real seriously. You know, I just, yeah. you know, it seems like politics always ruins everything. You know, you got some really good friend, you guys hit it off, but you got some little political difference, and <laughs> one gets really uptight about it. Or whatever. No, uh, but uh, no, it's uh, I, I I think it activates now exactly. You know, pro or con. You know, it's hard to say, but. Uh, but no, I think it, it, it yeah. and that's what they're intended to do, is to really get people <laughs> jacked up sometimes. And, and what first attracted you, you said you were an environmental activist. Mm -hmm. What first attracted you to activism? Well... Was it an event or a person? No, I, I, I'm an I'm a, uh, environmental educator. Educator. I've done some activist you know, stuff through that, yeah. but, uh, but uh, primarily, I, uh, after I'd been working in performing arts... Uh, for a number of years, I was like in my mid-30s when I kind of did a little soul-searching, and I thought, man, if I haven't got a foothold in this business by now, maybe it's time to get out of it, you know. I kind of realized, I said, I could be doing this the rest of my life and still never be any further along than I am. You know, I got, I got discouraged after being in it for so many years and still barely getting by, and uh, so that's when I decided to pursue an education, and... Uh, so I think what drove me to it originally, my direction, was the fact that having spent most of my life here in Southern California, where it's so, so much congestion, you know, this urban environment here, my, the way I would get out and kind of, kind of uh, level my head, you know, pacify myself, was I used to like to get out on my motorcycle and go out into the, into the foothills, or into the uh, mountains out there, you know, and just get out there on some old uh, mountain roads and stuff like that, and just get out there in the middle of the forest, you know. Yeah. And uh, once I was out there far enough where I could not hear any man-made sounds, you right? Know? And, Bond with uh, nature. Like. Exactly. And I'd spend, a, you know, and I started doing a lot of camping, and I'd go out and stay out there for several days at a time, pitch a tent out there, or whatever, you know. So, so that's how I kind of. And then more and more, when I was thinking, what else would I like to do if I'm not going to do the, the entertainment thing anymore? And I just thought I'd like to know about nature and perhaps you know do something where it would put me out in this environment, is you know, to work. You know, I'll go out and count birds or something you know right and uh so that's where i began pursuing it and then uh, i eventually uh obtained a uh, bachelor's degree in wildlife sciences got really into the the wildlife issues with you know threatened and endangered species and things like that and uh by the time i got out though i was like about 40 years old you know and i'm like physically i couldn't hold up like i used to you know and a lot of these Kind of environmental jobs that I was once interested in, you know, it requires hiking up steep mountains and things like that. I'm like, man, I'm not really cut out for that anymore. So then I just eventually decided to uh, pursue education and uh, went back and went to graduate school and got a master's in a couple of years. So uh, that's how I got into 
educating the, the environmental education you know so and I'm trying to go that direction with my with my videos right now I'm, I'm still kind of in the learning process with documentaries but more than anything I'm hoping sometime in the near future I can go out and start doing some uh, environmental documentaries you know and, and cover some wildlife issues and things like that so so hopefully that that lies ahead with me <laughs> that sounds good so you're still pursuing documentaries how m I know you shot the doc on Venice mm -hmm. you made the doc on Venice Beach and you made a doc on uh, Hobos and uh, <clears throat> riding the rails. Yeah. What other docs have you made? Well, you know, the riding the rails in the Venice Beach, those that was old video footage that I kind of put back together. Yeah. As far as stuff that I went out and shot, um, and I mentioned before about doing that documentary out in Oklahoma about this, this hanging. Yeah. And that kind of was a spare of the moment thing. I was making my way out here from my home in Tennessee. I, I, I usually spend the winters out here. And on my way out here last year, I have a cousin that lives in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I went and stayed there. I was just going to stay for a couple of days, and then we found out that John Fogarty was going to be playing later that week at the Hard Rock Cafe, and he can get us free tickets. And I thought, well, I'm going to stick around a couple extra days then. So somewhere in there, we had a day to kill. And it occurred to me not long before I left, I was reading the story about this lynching that took place down. It was like about an hour out of Tulsa. So he said, well, what do you want to do tomorrow? we got a whole day to kill. And it occurred to me, I said, you want to go out and help me make a documentary? He's like, yeah. <laughs> so that night I got online and kind of like researched all that stuff over again and kind of wrote out, wrote out my script and right. figured out how I was going to shoot it. And I was like, yeah, we went down there and shot it. So, But <clears throat> although that was the first thing I shot, actually the first thing that I put out was not long after I arrived here last year. It just so happened I was making my way up to San Francisco and I ended up taking uh, James Dean Highway. Yeah. Out there, the highway that he got killed on. And so just because I happened to be driving through there, I stopped and did a lot of shooting, and uh, I ended up, uh, there's this place out there uh, where James Dean made his last stop. He stopped and bought some apples at a little grocery store there, but uh, that, that location, what's it called? It's Blackwell's Corner, I think it's called, but they've got a couple of James Dean murals out there, big, beautiful things. And uh, just by chance, when I was there... The artist who created them was there. He lives up in Salinas, but he was down, and he said he noticed he was out there a few months ago, and he noticed that one of them's kind of aging. It's been up there for over 10 years, so he's yeah. kind of revarnishing it and stuff. So he's up there kind of touching it up. So I got an interview with him, and uh, so that was... I videotaped that, and so that was actually the first one, my first project, uh, right after I learned how to work this Adobe Premiere editing. Yeah. I decided to go ahead and put that one together before that Oklahoma one, because I, you know, right. I, I don't know, I was just more jazzed up about it since I just shot it. So, so the first one that I put out was James Dean Highway, and then, then after that I uh, put together, it's called The Nelson Lynchings of 1911, is the name of the, uh, the Oklahoma video yeah. documentary I shot. I've got those on my... Uh, Vimeo page. Your Vimeo page. So th that's yeah. four feature docs, or some of them are short docs? Well, those are both, both James Dean Highway and uh, the Nelson Lynchings are both like 14 or 15 minutes. Oh, 14 or 15. So you've done both, the short and the long. Right. Just, yeah, yeah, however long it takes to tell the story yeah. or whatever, you know. So yeah. I've got some projects right now that I'm working on that are probably going to be 90 minutes or more. Yeah. And uh, I mentioned uh, I'm about ready to start getting into editing my uh, Frank Zappa documentary. From, yeah. the, from the time that he spent in his pre-fame years out there where I'm where I'm at now in uh, the Ontario area. So yeah. interviewed a lot of people for that and shot a lot of videos. So I'm waiting to put that together. And then uh, when I went back home, and I guess this is the reason why I brought it up. I mentioned how Easy Rider had a big influence on me. And when I left and went back to Tennessee last year, I actually found all the old shooting locations from where the movie was shot, you know, and like the opening credits and stuff like that, they went through flags. So I found all these old locations and reshot them, you know. And then I, uh, after I'd been home for about a month or so, I eventually went down to New Orleans or uh, Louisiana because they didn't, you know, yeah. they, they bypass. People don't know that they bypass Texas because they knew with long hair you don't right. go through Texas, you know. So so they did a bunch of shooting like between here and Las Vegas, New Mexico, and then they jumped down to Louisiana. So I went down there about a month later and found all those scenes and shot them. And I ended up interviewing, I met up and interviewed with, uh, there was a famous scene in there where uh, they go into a roadside cafe and there's all those rednecks in there talking all kinds of crap about them, you know. And one of them's the, the, the deputy sheriff. And uh, when I got into town and I asked around, I found out that the deputy sheriff was still there. And somebody took me over to his farm and he invited me in and I got to sit down and interview him, you know. And he told me nice. about the experience of doing that movie, so... So that was that was a kick, I, you know, and uh, it's probably four, <coughs> forty years later or something, right? Right, right, yeah. right. So, uh, so yeah. Uh, so sometimes when I'm out doing these things, 
I just happened to be going in that area, so I didn't really do a whole lot of preparation. There's some places I want to go back to where I want to do a whole lot of research because I know there's people out there that yeah. can tell some stories. So I'm going to do a bunch of research and find these people and set things up before I go back again. You yeah. Know, so so uh, what the first track did you to pursue uh, doing a Frank Zappa documentary? You, I imagine you heard his music and yeah, you I, knew he was in your area. Yeah, it was kind of weird. Uh, the first time I discovered his music, I was like 14 years old. And I was born, and at this time I was still living in San Bernardino. And I remember it was after school. I was at one of my school friends' houses, and of course, like kids do then, we like to listen to music, you know. But I remember there playing some records at my friend's house, and I was flipping through his older brother's record collection. And I came upon this album that had kind of a kind of a trippy cover on it. It was like this one size fits all. Yeah, it was a couch floating in space, you know. Cal that, Shankle, that's a beautiful right, cover. Right, so just the the, the cover itself got my curiosity enough going to where I took a closer look at it. And then when I looked down the track listing, I saw that one of the songs was titled San Bernardino. I was like, oh, I got to hear this. It's a song about my hometown. And I guess as soon as the needle hit the vinyl, I became like an instant Zappa fan. But yeah. I know that that happened. And then like a year later, I moved out into the Ontario area. I was going to Montclair High School. And the first new Zappa album that came out after I discovered his music was that live one that he did with Captain Beefheart in Texas, uh, Bongo, Fury. Bongo Fury. And I saw that in the record store, the new Zappa albums. I'm looking down the track listing, and there's a song on there called Cucamonga. It's wow. like right next to where I'm now living. You know? <laughs> so I kind of almost felt like there was some kind of kindred spirit there with us. Yeah. You know? But I spent all these years in that same community in the Ontario area working as a struggling actor, and I was performing on local stages and you know, working yeah. at this theater, you know. but I was trying to pursue an acting career around there. And at the same time, I heard a lot about the Zappa legacy from his time that he spent there. And yeah, he had a studio over here and he bought his first electric guitar from this music store over here yeah. and things like that. So I kind of heard those stories uh, at the time. But uh, just sometime when I started thinking about getting back into documentaries again, it just there was something there where I thought the fact that I was a poor struggling artist there about 20 years after he was. Yeah. <laughs> but we were both in that same area going through the same struggles, you know. So that's when I got decided uh you know i looked into it more and more about his specific time here and right. learned more and more about it. i said i gotta get back to california and do this documentary you know? yeah so. hey we look forward to uh, seeing that tim when you get the zappa done yeah. and uh especially because you got an interview with ray collins before yes. he passed away so yeah. so uh <clears throat> back to a few more philosophical questions what do you think is more important conviction or compromise what's more important yeah Conviction or compromise? Kind of give me some example. What do you mean by conviction? You mean like uh, the well, feeling of conviction? Yeah, I would say feeling definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like being uh, you know directed towards something specifically because you're concerned about it mm -hmm. and uh, believing in it mm -hmm. and you know. Well, I don't like compromise. You know? <laughs> uh, so, what's more important? I, I guess conviction. That's yeah, fine. Yeah, I really is think. is ambition based more on fear or joy? I think it's based more on curiosity than anything else. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Is loyalty based on reason? It's supposed to be. It should be. <laughs> I don't think it always is, though. <laughs> T.S. Eliot said that poetry is outing your inner dialogue. You were talking sort of earlier, you mentioned something like inner consciousness. We have these inner things. What language is your inner dialogue in? My inner dialogue? Yeah. Oh, sometimes I think it's in a language that only I could understand. <laughs> <laughs> There's some things you just can't explain to people. Yeah. You can't put it in words. You know? That's well put. <laughs> is perception reality? Not always, no. no. You can have uh, surrealistic uh, perception. <laughs> yeah. On what occasion do you lie? When do I lie? Probably like anybody else, when it'll save my ass. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, I try to be very honest. That, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I try not to. I, I try not to be in a situation where I have to lie. Yeah. You know? <laughs> That's good. Why is it so difficult for humans to consider the possibility that life may be pointless? 
Run that by me again. Why is it so difficult for humans mm -hmm. to consider the possibility that life may be pointless? Uh, I think it's kind of a, it's it's an easier alternative, you know. Yeah. It's like you know, if it's pointless, then there's then then you know why have any hope or why why have any uh, ambition or goals to accomplish anything you know yeah so I think I think it's kind of a lazy man's out <laughs> yeah well put <clears throat> Moshe Feldenkrais works with healing and movement he says it's literally possible to identify a weakness mm -hmm. <clears throat> and incorporate it to become a strength rather than we're normally taught to overcome a weakness mm -hmm. can you tell me a weakness that you've actually incorporated to become a strength weakness that became a strength yeah well just through my life's experiences in general you know the older you get and the more experiences you go through you know hopefully you you know whatever mistakes you've made whatever consequences whatever uh whatever pains you felt you learn not to do that again you know <laughs> or you know what to avoid or whatever you know yeah. just uh so uh so it's it's kind of like you know I, and I was I was talking to a friend of mine he and I both had similar experiences where uh, when we were young adults we both got our hearts broken you know we were chasing after a serious relationship and ended up feeling all emotionally twisted and it was just a horrible miserable feeling to go through but since that happened we've all gone through experiences where it's like if I hadn't gone through that before I would have been a wreck when this happened but instead it was just kind of like you know <laughs> it's training for you. exactly you know you don't you get all that out of the out of your system you get that out of, out of the way early I guess whoops <laughs> anyway right. but right right you know you get that out of the way and then then later on in life you, you certainly can uh, learn to deal with that kind of stuff a whole lot easier you know yeah. any kind of experiences you know you go through it before very good American Indians in Eastern culture respect their elders. Can you explain Western culture's disdain for old age? I don't know if that's so much true anymore. You know, it used to be, like I mentioned before, like with the radio and, you know, parents listen to one thing and the kids listen to the other and all that stuff. I know that, yeah, when I was growing up, it was definitely a lot of us versus them going through the 60s and and uh, all that rebellion, you know. So, uh, but... Uh, but no, I don't think that there's as much of a generation gap nowadays as there used to be. I, I think I think the fact that there, the fact that people from my generation went through that gap, you know, and uh, so uh, I hope that answers that question. No, no, that was yeah, fine. I kind of lost what it was. No, <laughs> that was fine. And um, great filmmaker and uh, film festival founder George Manupelli, his mantra is "Ignore yourself." Uh -huh. Jonas Mikas, another great filmmaker experimental filmmaker says there is no self-expression Cecil Taylor jazz piano says I'm just a vehicle and this stuff just comes through me do you think art making you know acting theater documentary filmmaking is more self-expression or more we're just vehicles for whatever culture or technology is dominant yeah, that all depends on how conscientious the creator is. I think, yeah, you know? and uh, but uh, run that last part where there was I had a thought there, but I lost. Yeah, it. no, that was really good. Yeah. What you just said, how con how aware they are, how yeah. conscious they are. I is know. It, is it more? Oh, go ahead. No, I, I think I was. I think I was starting to get on there. Uh, as far as uh, as far as what I'm putting out there and what what's going to be seen. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Now no, give me that again. <laughs> is it? Are you more? Is the is the cre the maker more a vehicle for oh. whatever culture or technology is dominant, or is it more a form of self expression? Self expression. Yeah. yeah. That's that's. Uh, I I think uh, anything that I'm going to focus on, whatever I'm going to, as far as making a documentary or whatever, whatever I'm going to focus on, it's it's definitely means something to me you yeah know? And, and I obviously think that it, it it might mean something to other people you yeah know? so it's it's definitely a self-expression and uh, and it's kind of like you know it's like I'm gonna take this journey because I'm very interested in learning about this subject you're welcome to come along you yeah know? <laughs> that's kind of the way I, I try to put it in my uh, productions yeah and can art making or movie making acting be egoless Problem? No, I don't think so. I think the ego is is, is, is too strong. It's always there, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so. Why are most artists liberal? That's 
That's a good question. I never. You know, <laughs> that's really good. Why are most artists liberal? Liberal arts. Uh, I don't know. I guess they, maybe they've got more of a vision than a, than a conservative would. You know, <laughs> more vision there. I think. Uh, I think you know some people. Uh, some people come up with their own expressions, and other people just are kind of like parrots, just kind of repeat <laughs> what they hear, you know. Uh, so, you know, it's probably a lot, it has a lot to do with conscientious thought and so forth, but, uh, but uh, I don't know, that's, that's what I get out of it. I think, yeah. uh, I think there's more, more conscientious thought in, 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 the, in the arts, and that creates, somehow creates liberalism. <laughs> yeah. Can anger be a productive emotion? Yeah, yeah. It kind of reminds me of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm when I come out here, I've been spending the winters out here because uh, I'm kind of helping take care of my father. My father's 93 years old, and now I've got some anxiety issues. That's I had to I had to leave my uh, teaching job because I had a, I had a panic attack there. But I've got some anxiety issues of my own, and I'm out here helping my father. And I was taking him somewhere. Well. When he gets lost or whatever, I mean, it didn't take much for him to get real nervous. And when he does, then he's just like ripping into me, you know. And he's just like, he just won't get off my case. You know, he'll just go on and on and on and on. In the meantime, I've got these anxiety issues that I'm trying to deal with. So I'm trying to keep a calm head so I can kind of get out of this little jam. <laughs> and, and at one point, I just got so upset, you know. And I've never done this before, but I raised my voice and yelled at my dad. I said, well, I guess I'm just a fuck up. That shut him up, man. You know, there was a dead silence, you know. And I felt bad about it, and I apologized a little bit later, but it's like, you know, that was an angerous spurt, but it definitely it definitely got him off my case, you know. Yeah. So so in that sense like that, it, yeah, it was anger can be productive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well done. Uh, can satire be destructive? Satire can be destructive, yeah. You know, uh... I don't know how to elaborate on that, but, uh, you know, we all have different uh, taste in humor and sense of humor and stuff like that, you know. So what a lot of people would laugh about, you know, if they got a good sense of humor on satire, you know, there are always a few that will feel offended for some reason, you know. Right. So. Is human progress more cyclical, or is it cyclical or cumulative? Are we just going in circles or are we getting better or worse? Well, we're driving forward, but at the same time, I think it was George Carlin that said that uh, uh, the Earth and the humans' place on it, we're, it's, all, it's all like an evolutionary cul-de-sac, you know? That's good. <laughs> so, I like George. Yeah. So, yeah, I, that's why I, I agree with him on that. It's We're all an evolutionary cul-de-sac. You can only go so far, you know? What's... Oh, go ahead. Well, I was just saying, yeah. only well, go so far before, before you start looping around, you know, certainly. Yeah. What's the most significant difference between women and men, physical aside? The most significant difference? Yeah. I've always believed that women are what keeps the human race civil, you know. Yeah. Women are the, are the civil thinkers, you know. And uh, I think men are, men are more irrational. And, yeah. And uh, so it's... it's uh, I always thought that you know if, if if women didn't exist or if 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 we were all exactly the same, yeah, we'd all be running around like a bunch of heathens. Yeah. You know? I mean, why why do men behave themselves? Because they know they're not going to get laid if they get crazy. You know? exactly. <laughs> when I was going to college, I had a woman friend of mine who was a little tiny girl, man, little little petite thing. She probably didn't. She's probably like maybe five feet tall and maybe weighed ninety pounds, you know. But she's like probably like the size of my arm. But when we were together. She could keep me in my place without ever saying a word. Every once in a while, I'd get like really, we'd be in a restaurant or something. I'd get upset about something. I'd start to yell. Without saying a word, she just had this way of throwing her eyes at me. And I knew that that was my cue to shut the hell up, you know. And I would, you know, because if I didn't, I'd catch hell from her later, you know. So that kind of a lot of people were amused by that. Seeing this girl who was like less than half my size keep me, <laughs> keep me so on the leash like that, you know. <laughs> Gee, that's a good start. So why do women live longer than men? Do they? Yeah. I don't know, maybe because because uh, they hadn't. Uh, I don't know. You know, of course, men are the hunters, so men are, are you know more physically use their bodies. Yeah. You know? So that's all right. Yeah. 
you create what you resist. That's just a saying. I'm not saying I agree or disagree with it. Bob Goldthwait even took it farther. He says, you are what you hate. Mm -hmm. James Joyce wrote, it's a curious thing how much your mind is supersaturated with the religion in which you say you disbelieve. In fact, Louis Bunuel nailed it. He said, thank God I'm an atheist. <laughs> so, this whole idea, you create what you resist. What do you think of that? Any comments? Or one creates what, not you, right. me, Tim, but one creates what one resists. One creates what one what one resists. I guess it's kind of like uh, the feeling of fear, you know. Yeah. You only fear what you fear, you know. Yeah. I mean, you know, it does, it's not necessarily something to be feared. It's not necessarily something scary unless you make it that, you know. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, yeah, so it's kind of like, uh, and you see this all the time out on the boardwalk, you know, a lot of people, they fear the unfamiliar. Yeah. You know, so if uh, if they see some guy who looks like a weirdo freak and they've never talked to one before, they're probably going to think like, I don't know, this guy's scary, right? Yeah. You know, they're they're going to, you know, stay away. But, you know, and I, I'll tell you, it kind of reminds me of when I was younger, back when I was in my 20s and stuff like that, you know, and I guess... I guess I was at that time what people would have called a hippie or something. I don't know if I was or not, but yeah. I was kind of an outcast either way, you know. But so many of my friends, so many people who I became and developed friendships with, I, it was it was so old to hear this, but so many of them say to me, you know, when I first met you, I just kind of assumed that you were this kind of guy, that you were like this, like that, and a few other things, blah, 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 blah. You know, but, man, once I got to know you, man, I realized that, you know, you're the opposite of all that, you know. <laughs> And it's like, well, that's the thing, you know, you you can't judge a book by its cover, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Look into it and you might be enlightened, so. Well, I think you have a curiosity, you know, plays a big part in your drive and your incentive. Mm -hmm. You think you got that on your own or the way your parents raised you or combo or? <sighs> how'd you get, I mean, I would say that's a major element yeah. of who Tim is. is right. Right. That drive to learn and curiosity. Yeah, and it was just one of those, I don't know, some people just go by what others tell them, and I yeah. could never do that. I had to go out and experience things for myself and draw my own conclusions and my own right. opinions and so forth, you know? So, uh, you know, I know sometimes I've been in workplaces where people say, like, oh, stay away from this person. Oh, she's a bitch, man. Just don't even deal with her, you know? Yeah. And, and I'll be kind of conscientious and on my toes when I'm around that person. But as long as they're nice to me and everything like that, I can care what the reputation is. Right. It's like, that has nothing to do with me. She's nice to me. Right. You know? So. <laughs> it's good. Tim, how do you find peace of mind? Peace of mind? Well, like I said, uh, at times when, especially when I'm mentally feeling very overburdened, it's just a matter of, like I said, I used to go out into the wilderness and stuff like that. Just get away from all distractions and just kind of sit and just kind of like, just... Let it all go for a while, you know. Yeah. They take that load off your mind, you know. Yeah. So, uh, so people do different, you know. That's like I said. I used to when I was back out riding freight trains and stuff like that. That was one of those kind of a recreations that I would, you know, I would use sometimes just to kind of clear my mind. I mean, just go out and jump on a freight train. I'll ride it out to Yuma, Arizona, and back. And by the time I get back, I'll be a little better, better wow. off. You know? So. So you that was that's a pretty amazing yeah. move because people yeah. would say, well, that's first of all, it's illegal right. and it's the tradition of the hobos. Right. What right. attracted you to that? Just that freedom to get. I think well, get away on your own. Well, first I started off doing my cross country motorcycle riding, and I think you know after I'd done that, maybe I was just looking for another another adventure, another traveling adventure of some sort. The traveling know? adventure where yeah. you're you're not necessarily driving, you're right. riding. Right, right. I just want to you know. It's really been romantic. Get somewhere. I don't care where, just as long as it's not where I'm at right now. You know. <laughs> and you know, hobos are so misunderstood. Yeah, I think I yeah. told you my one of my favorite jokes is, what's the difference between a hobo and a bum? Bum goes, got a spare cigarette? Hobo goes, smoking alone? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I uh, I enjoy that. I haven't done that in years, but, uh, you know, yeah, some people like to go hunting or fishing or, you know, uh, camping or whatever, but, yeah, that was something that I liked. I just like to go out and ride the freight trains, you know. But it seems normal person that there's a high risk in being injured. It's not. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. It, it is, oh, yeah. yeah. It's risky. You gotta, you definitely gotta know what you're doing. You, know, you gotta be on your toes at all times, and uh, and the the train itself, you know, this, you know, 
I, yeah, it, it, people have been crushed out there in the yards. You never know when it's going to jolt or whatever, you know. And uh, so, yeah, I know that's happened. People are they're, they're trying to get from one side of the yard to the other, and they've got all these lines that, you know, they got to try to cut across. So where those coupling units are, you know, they're trying to, like, cross across there. But it happens, somebody, they're going to they're gonna back a engine into it or something like that, and boom, you, you never know when that thing's going to jolt, you know. Yeah. And uh, so... Yeah, there's there's danger in riding in and of itself with the trains, but then also there is a growing criminal element out there yeah. too. You know, so you never know when you're out there in those railroad yards. You know, uh, you get accosted, you can yell and scream at the top of your lungs, and who's going to hear you? You know, yeah. that's so so you got definitely got to got to know how to read people as well. You yeah, know, when you're out there. So, if you were walking down the street today and you met yourself as a 12 year old, what would you say to your 12 year old self? <laughs> What would I say to my 12-year-old self? Uh, I'd probably try to give myself some advice on, you know, what lies ahead, you know. And uh, just tell them, you know, be conscientious, you know. Watch out for a lot of things, you know. Don't let your guard down. Yeah. You know? well, watch who you make friends with, you know, and things like that. So, you know. Good. The kind of advice that I think any any parent would give to a kid, probably. Yeah. Tim, should toilet paper go off the roll, over or under? For some reason, I've always done over, and uh, I don't know when when it when it's under. I don't know. There's that fear that it might touch. Whoa! There's a fear that it might touch the floor. You know. Yeah. And uh, so I don't know. I've always preferred to go over. <laughs> yeah. If a publisher was to release your autobiography, just off the top of your head, what would the title be? What would the title of my autobiography be? Oh, off the top of my head, probably something like uh, Dunn and Ben. <laughs> Dunn and Ben, that's a good title. I've never had that. Now, they want to scent the glue in the binding. What smell would it be? They want to scent the glue in the binding. What smell would it be? Oh, probably just kind of a nature scent, you know, pine or, yeah, you know. Uh, I can't remember. There was this, when I was working, when I was building sets uh, for some of the performing arts centers I worked with, there was some kind of a wood product that we would sprinkle on the floor. It kind of helped to clean, clean the floor. But whatever it was, it smelled really good, you know. I forget what kind of wood that was that that came from, though. But, uh, yeah, there's some really good good smelling woods out there, you know. Right. Something that would take somebody in that with that smell, maybe take them out there and do it. I like that. Yeah. If a statue was built in your honor, where would you want it displayed, and what would it be made of? Oh man. <laughs> where would it be displayed, and what would it? Oh. I'm gonna have to pass on that. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Tim, tell me something good you never had and you never want. Something good that I never had and never wanted? Yeah. It's good? It's good, you never had it, but you never want it. Well, you know, I've lived most of my life streamlined, and I have noticed that people who have a lot of money, they're so preoccupied, worried that somebody's going to take yeah. it from them, you know? Yeah. And I think a lot of that with my father, you know, I mean, you know, he's doing all right, but man, he is just so overtly paranoid, you know, all doors have to be locked at all times, and when you go out to, to a, you know, somebody, I, I've gone out with people before where uh, they've got this big stretched Lincoln Continental or whatever they got, yeah. and we go into some parking area, we're going to go right. out to a restaurant, but they've got to park under a lamp. Yeah, you know, they got to make sure that you know it's under because if it's under a lamp, then nobody will bother the car, you know. Yeah, and they'll circle that parking lot and take twenty minutes and then park a mile away so they can get under a light, you know. And I'm like. What good is it to have money if this that, is what the mindset yeah. puts you in? You Anyways, know? you're just giving the criminal more life. What's the <laughs> right? point? <laughs> Whatever. I'm just like, it's like I don't care to be right. It, it's like there was so old, paranoid. There was an old the blues time. guy that once said that you know he said uh, he said it's no crime to be poor, but having money isn't a bad thing either. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's kind of like yeah, I mean yeah, it would be it would be nice to to be financially more secure but at the same time i don't want it to just yeah. drive me nuts you know that's good i like that uh in fact i do get that answer tell me something good you never had and you never want it's usually fame money or heroin right. those are the three main answers <laughs> yeah. I get. 
If you were in, in a vat of vomit up to your neck and someone threw a bag of shit at your face, what would you do? I'd probably just let it hit me. If I'm in a <laughs> bag of vomit, what's that going to do, you know? <laughs> and, um, let's see, uh, there's one question I want to ask you about, um, what guides your decision making? You know, Allen Ginsberg says, first thought, best thought. Jonah Lehrer wrote how we decide, says fast blink decisions aren't always aren't always useful. And Malcolm Gladwell recommends gut decision making. But in just in general, what guides your decision making? Well, I try not to let it be guided too much by impulse, because that's when you you know, you know you don't want to act too fast, you know. Yeah. Or as Dylan said, don't speak too soon, the wheel's still in spin, you know. So, uh, Bob Dylan said that right. That was what was that in his uh, heart, uh, times they are a changing, yeah. <laughs> Don't speak too soon because the wheels spill still and spin. I repeat that quote a lot with my friends and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> Don't say it again. Don't speak too soon, speak yeah. too yeah. soon, yeah, because yeah. the wheels still and spin. <laughs> Uh, another favorite D Bob Dylan of mine is is don't ever tell anyone everything you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> he got that one from the Bible. Oh, is that right? But the the new one I'm I'm just repeating too is uh, I didn't invent Bob Dylan. He's always been here. Right. <laughs> That's heavy. So did I answer that? Um, yeah. That's fine. Okay. Yeah, it is basically what guides your decision making. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, thought, and, you know, yeah. okay, put some thought into it. Yeah. And a um, couple more questions, and we're almost done. Okay. I really appreciate your time, Tim. It's been fun. Um, yeah. The thing about blame, do you think humans are hardwired to blame? What's the function of blame? I always use this example, Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath, the movie version. The guy stand there with a the gun, and, you know, up here from his town comes in the car and says, you got to leave this land because they're going to put a freeway here. And he goes, listen, my grandfather farmed this land, my father farmed this land, I farmed this land, we own this land, so who do I shoot? <laughs> you know, so what do you think is the function of blame? Does it work? And, and uh, you know, are we hardwired for it, basically? Any thoughts yeah, on that? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, we're hardwired for it. So, you like, think as long as you know, if, uh, if if you make a mistake, how can I get out of this? How can how can I how can I uh, avoid retribution in any way? Well, yeah. can I blame somebody else? You know. Yeah. And uh, so it's just yeah, it's it's a it's a fear thing, you know. It's like, you know, nobody wants to have to to be a man and fess up, you know, or as they say in these days, man up, you know. Yeah. And uh, so I mean, yeah, some of those people that I've known in my life, it's like you know they cannot fess up to anything. They've always got to blame somebody, you know. As right. long as it's not them, you know. <laughs> yeah. And do you think we're hardwired for competition, or you know, what's the function of competition? Uh, one gentleman says games were created to give non-heroes the illusion of winning. In real life, you don't really know who won or lost, but you can tell who is a hero and who is not. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty heavy. You know, yeah. what do you think is what do you? Why do you think we have to be competitive? Is it is it healthy or? Well, I'll tell you. The reason why I moved out of Southern California and I went to Tennessee, I've been there for like 18 years now. Yeah. Is because everything was just so damn competitive out here. Yeah. It's, there was, you know, there's more people than resources, right? So yeah. it's like, you know, it, it, it drives you into this survival mode for survival of the fittest, as I used to teach in my biology days. You know, it's, uh, you know, yeah. the, peop the people who you th would think was your closest friends are going to have to stab you in the back in order for them to take a step ahead or whatever, you know. Yeah. And it's like, it's just, it drives people, it, 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 it brings, it, it bubbles up a ugly side of humanity, you know. And so when I was taking these cross-country journeys, I'd get there back east to where the open land was and just the whole attitude was so much more laid back. Yeah. And uh, I think... The easiest way to describe the difference, uh, kind of something that I kind of figured out after I'd been there for about a year, was uh, what I noticed is that out here in California, if you go into a fast, uh, convenience store, you need to get a pack of cigarettes or something. You go into a convenience store, 
you're probably going to have to wait behind five or six people there. You go to a convenience store back east, you go in there, there's one person there at the counter. You know, only one person you got to wait behind. But it still takes just as long to get it in and out of there. Because <laughs> out here, with all that competition and all that congestion, and people are trying to move. So people are fast here, you know, they're moving. Right. Out there, nah, man, they're in What's no hurry. hurry at all. They man. assume that you're not either, you know. Yeah. They're going to sit there and tell you all about their kids and whatever else is going on on their farm that day, and they figure you want to hear it too, you know. And, and I'm that, just like, <laughs> you know, right, it's, it's like that mosey right. word. I'm just moseying along. Right. So that was something that I had to adjust to was the slower pace out there, you know. But that's yeah. what I went out there for to get away from all this madness you know that's cool and and you appreciate it you, you oh, yeah. live in that slower pace and as you realize been there ever since yeah. so that's uh it almost uh evokes this Paul Krasner joke he said um you know he's uh lived in Venice uh -huh. for so many years but he was raised in New York so he went back for a trip and you know he was at a convenience store and he bought something and he looked at the clerk and he says, why aren't you going to tell me to have a nice day? She goes, it's printed on your fucking receipt. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, somebody in New York would say it that way, whereas in California, right. have a nice right. day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, New York's a tricky town. <laughs> so uh, what's <coughs> the healthiest cultural shift you see developing today? The healthiest cultural shift? Yeah. Uh, well, of course, technology kind of dictates everything, you know, and, uh, so, you know, our, our culture today is, uh, and again, I, I don't like to, uh, to quote, to, to, you know, I've quoted him before, but, uh, George Carlin, though, did have this whole bit about how everybody today is being bought off by toys and gizmos, and now we've yeah. got cell phones that'll make you pancakes and scratch your nuts for you. <laughs> you, know, it's like, you know, it's like everybody's being bought off by toys and gizmos. As long as we've got these toys, then we're not going to complain about anything, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Very well put. Guy who lived in the Venice Canals, too. Yeah. <laughs> so... So Thornton Wilder, guy wrote Our Town, pretty good play, and uh -huh. uh, in 28 he said, Art is confession. Art is the secret told. But art is not only the desire to tell the secret, it's the desire to tell it and hide it at the same time. Uh -huh. Tim, you've really been articulate explaining all these ways of life with me today, and I appreciate it. You told us what it's about. What's it really about? <laughs> What's it really about? Yeah. <laughs> There's a secret in there somewhere, <laughs> you know. Sometimes it seems like it's the blind leading the blind, you know. Yeah. It's like, you know, I don't know where I'm going, so why are you following me? <laughs> <laughs> that is a good line. That's a, all who wander. Well, are that's not hobo philosophy. Lost. There was yeah. I, I remember uh, I quoted that once uh, on a CD that I made. It's some hobo philosophy that I picked up where uh, I was. Most of the full-time writers out there, they really didn't care where they were going as long as they were mobile, whereas I always had a specific destination that I was trying to get to. Right. I knew where I wanted to go, you know. So I remember trying to get some directions from somebody, and it's like, somebody told me that I should ride the Southern Pacific into the uh, Phoenix Rail Yard and then get on the... the right. You know, and I, but anyway, when it came to getting directions, this one guy just tells me, he said... It doesn't matter how you get there if you don't know where you're going. <laughs> and I was like, well, I do know where I'm going or where I'm trying to get to, but that was their philosophy of life. Right. Doesn't matter how you get there so you don't know where you're going. When the train comes, just jump on it and see where it takes you, you know? That is, that is a great, I mean, the, the hobo is the ultimate American <laughs> yeah. in a lot of ways that didn't get fucked up. Right. You know, everybody else got fucked up and the hobo's like, chill, dude. What, you know, the 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 probably the greatest hobo line is I started out with nothing I still got most of it left yeah <laughs> so Tim it's really been a pleasure I have one last question and I thank you uh -huh. um, what gives you the most optimism the most optimism you know without that drive you know the, the, the most optimism I think it has it's a part uh, creative expression you know yeah. it's like you know again it's like i said you know you get these visions in your head and you're not going to be satisfied until and that was like when i first got into doing the, the, the like with this documentary thing when i did this venice beach video so many years ago i was telling myself back then i i could see it all in my head and i thought if i can just put on the screen what i envision in my head you know if i can just put it on there and see what it looks like you know 
I mean, it looks brilliant in my mind, you know. Right. So it's just, yeah, I just had to do that. I had to visualize the thought. You know, I had to get it on the screen to see what it was, you know, what it looked like. So, uh, so, you know, there's optimism in in trying to uh, trying to come up with some something creative that is fulfilling and will will put on a positive effect on other people yeah know? though some other people will get something out of this yeah you know? it's, it's it's maybe that's the educator in me i want to enlighten other people you yeah know? i feel enlightened i want to share that with others yeah know? so sharon's a great attitude and uh really looking forward to showing venice beach 1985 yeah. tonight and uh tim corbin it's really been a pleasure yes, sir jerry thank, thank you for you. having me over it's really it's nice very interesting